Hello and welcome to the course Anterior Segment Disease and the Systemic Link um, between Anterior Segment Disease and Systemic Conditions. My name is Mila Brujic and uh, absolutely honored to be here and be presenting during this um, really, really kind of breakthrough um, type of format here with this online conference and truly appreciate being part of this this conference and the commitment that they're actually um, showing to optometric ed education in new and innovative ways. This is an area that I'm pretty passionate about and part of the reason for that is I think that we as optometry, we own this space and what I'm hoping that you get over the next 50 minutes is a new appreciation for the greater role that we can play in healthcare, not only in monitoring conditions that are what I consider almost a staple of chronic conditions in, opt in the optometric practice, some of the more chronic ocular conditions that we're, again, on a daily basis involved in managing medically, but also these conditions that, again, have this systemic link and where we can really um, provide a greater level of influence in terms of a patient's quality of life, again, not only necessarily locally treating their um, their ocular issues or conditions, but at a more systemic level, identifying certain things and providing guidance in areas where most patients don't necessarily um, think that an, an optometrist might give that, that type or that level of direction, ultimately providing better care for that individual or that patient. Now, um, two things I wanted to keep out of the lectures today were dry eye and allergic eye disease, because we know that those obviously can have some systemic associations, but I really wanted to keep those out of the discussion today and focus on other anterior segment diseases, because there are a number of courses that are focused around the more chronic ocular conditions and dry eye, and I know that there will be um, discussions amongst or within those within those courses on those issues. Now, before we get started, is it, it is important that you do know my disclosures. Now, I don't have any financial or proprietary interest in any of the products that I'm gonna be describing or discussing or mentioning. Um, I am a co-owner uh, with Dr. Kading of Optometric Insights, which is um, initially a company that we created for career coaching for optometry students. We've now really expanded into a number of other areas in optometry as well, too. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm a practitioner. Um, spend most of my time seeing patients involved in the trenches and patient care. So ideally, what I'm hoping to do over this next hour is not only present you with the newest contemporary information in all the topics that we're going to be describing or discussing, but, but give it to you in a real practical feel or sense. Like, what do you do on a daily basis when you see these individuals or you see these entities? And how do you actually take the next steps in order to care for these individuals or these patients? It's also important to know that um, I do work with a number of companies and industries, and, and this is, and I hold the relationships that I have with these companies that are listed here in high regards, because this is ultimately what gives me the ability to um, really stay contemporary and current with the knowledge base that I'm actually sharing with you today. So the first thing we're going to be talking about here is corneal verticillata. Now, this is an interesting uh, finding on the ocular surface. It's sometimes referred to as vortex keratopathy, but it's really almost a warlike pattern um, on the cornea. They're gray deposits, and, and you can sometimes even see them without utilizing a slit lamp. You can, um, you can look at it and sometimes see it in retroillumination with an O-scope. You can also see it um, sometimes just with simply with the naked eye and a transilluminator. What happens is there's accumulations in the cellular lipids in the basal epithelial layer of the cornea. And what's interesting with this is it doesn't usually cause any type of decrease in best corrected visual acuity. Now saying that, some of these individuals may actually complain about um, more glare in their vision or nighttime issues with their vision, depending on where this pattern um, in the cornea is actually located. Now, individuals will typically be asymptomatic, but again, remember to keep in mind this, this question of additional glare in the evening and low light levels. One of the ways that you can help individuals, in particular if they're starting to notice some of these, uh, this vortex keratopathy um, when the pupil um, expands or enlarges in low light levels, is to discuss or at least have somewhat of a conversation of the, um, the utilization of alpha-GAN-P 
in a non-FDA approved manner, simply being able to utilize that medication to prevent pupil dilation and low light levels. And the way that that acts is it's an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist, and it acts on the presynaptic nerve ending. So essentially, the nerve that innervates the smooth muscle, essentially that muscle that um, allows dilation of the pupil, what it does is it prevents um, it, it prevents uh, the uh, the um, or, or it causes a negative feedback loop to occur. So normally, what happens is norepinephrine um, accumulates in high quantities in the cleft. But what ends up happening in these individuals is that negative feedback loop receptor gets activated by the alpha two adrenergic agonist or the alpha GAN, and essentially it creates a scenario where now you're not activating or actively activating the smooth muscle um, in the dilator. And because of that, the sphincter muscle takes over and the pupil somewhat constricts. Again, it's more of a prevention of pupil dilation than it is constriction, but ultimately you have the sphincter muscle that's simply acting on its own. Um, if it's secondary to medication use, um, maybe it may be uh, when the medication is discontinued or if it's dis discontinued, you'll actually see this vortex keratopathy slowly dissipate um, anywhere between a month to six months after the medication has been discontinued. Um, and again, it also can be caused secondary to some type of systemic conditions. Now, what does it look like clinically? Well, here are two examples of patients that have vortex keratopathy. And again, remember these are gray opacities that are present at the level of the, the basal cells of the epithelium and also the anterior stroma. And essentially what you're looking at here is again these, these gray patterns that create this whore-like um, appearance. Now when you're looking at these clinically, you need to keep in mind the differential diagnosis with these individuals. Again, what you're looking at here is simply a a larger magnified view at the slit lamp. All of these videos that you'll be seeing throughout the presentation are videos that are taken at my slit lamp. We've equipped most of our slit lamps with video capabilities in order to do a few things. One, we can actually monitor the condition over time, whatever it is that we are following. And the second thing we have the ability to do is provide um, what I feel is more appropriate patient education and help them really understand just in fact what is happening, what we're seeing. Oftentimes what I find is as we start getting into some of our technical jargon when we're describing to patients what we're seeing, oftentimes we lose them and when we give them this visual um, ability to see this, we just help them gain a greater appreciation for what we're physically seeing on the cornea. But what's important to note here is that you don't see any level of corneal staining that's present here you really don't see corneal staining when you see vortex keratopathy such as this. So what do we need to put on our list of differential diagnoses? Well, there are several things. Um, first, like you see on the left, um, you actually see an individual who had a corneal abrasion and now is actually healing. And this is one of those conditions that we need to place on our list of differenti differentials. Really, the way we differentiate this from a uh, vortex keratopathy is by the presence of significant staining that's present here. On the right-hand side, what we actually see is an individual who's had several um, corneal scars present from recurrent herpetic epithelial keratitis. And again, you can see them inferiorly on the cornea, and then as we look at this individual's right eye more temporally on the cornea as well too, you'll see these scars. But these are things that need to be differentiated, and usually the history and also the appearance will help us differentiate between these conditions. And again, looking at an active herpetic epithelial keratitis lesion, it's much different than obviously those, those scars that were present in the, in the previous um, slide. But what you can see here are lesions that actively stain with fluorescein. On the left hand side you can see that very very easily noted here. And you can see that classic dendrite again that stains with fluorescein. And you also have that halo of fluorescein around it. Um, as we know um, that typically occurs because around the ulcer the epithelium is essentially loose, loosened and that'll just simply let uh, fluorescein diffuse into larger areas other than just the dendrites. On the right hand side, the reason why I share this with you is it's uh, a cross section through the cornea. 
And what you can see is the fluorescein staining, but you can also see the fluorescein permeating into deeper areas of the cornea. Again, this just won't be seen with vortex keratopathy. So what are some of the reasons that actually cause this? Well, one of the most common medications that cause this is something referred to as amiodarone. Amiodarone is an antiarrhythmic um, agent um, and is utilized for individuals with heart conditions or chronic heart conditions. Um, hydroxychloroquinolone and chloroquinolone, although are less likely to cause this, can in fact cause this. One of the things that I would advise is if you see an individual with reduced best corrective visual acuity that does have vortex keratopathy, is taking Plaquenil, um, certainly make sure to rule out any type of macular changes that may be occurring there that may be causing the decrease in best corrected visual acuity. Because although it can cause a slight reduction in vision, it's very rare that it does. And then there is indomethacin that can also cause this vortex keratopathy to occur as well. One of the, the systemic conditions that can cause this to occur is Febreze disease. Now Febreze disease um, is a genetic lysosomal storage disease. So what are lysosomes? Well lysosomes are small um, pockets within the cells in our body that remove waste from those cells. Now what occurs here is there's a deficiency of an enzyme called alpha-galactosidase A. This causes glycolipids to then accumulate within the, lyso within the lysosomes but ultimately in larger quantities um, in blood vessels, tissues, and other organs. And, and what that actually does is it causes these symptoms to start to arise. Now these symptoms will usually result or occur in children or young adults. And again, there's oftentimes pain to the extremities or the GI tract. There's kidney or sometimes cardiac involvement. There's these angiokeratomas, these small little um, capillary clusters at the, at the level of the dermis. Uh, again, they simply look like large, almost red nodules on the skin. And then there's anhydrosis as well, too, this inability to sweat. And usually these individuals will complain about this generalized fatigue or neuropathy that we see that's very, very typical in individuals with Febreze disease. It's diagnosed through measuring enzyme activity. And essentially, the enzyme assay for alpha-galactosidase is actually performed. Now, what's interesting in these individuals, it's, it's usually X-linked. So in females, it'll often require a genetic test because oftentimes in females, the um, because females have two X chromosomes, um, oftentimes symptoms won't be quite quite as severe as we see in some of our in some of their male counterparts and it's treated with something called fab fabrazyme which is an alpha galactosidase enzyme and this is delivered to individuals intravenously through infusion so typically what happens in the office again the first thing we ask about is medication use, um, and oftentimes it's older individuals or a more senior population that are utilizing amiodarone, or it's those middle-aged individuals to more senior individuals that may be on uh, chloroquinolone or hydroxychloroquinolone for chronic uh, rheumatoid arthritis or some other type of autoimmune conditions. And oftentimes it's our younger individuals that present with um, uh, vortex keratopathy that may be associated with Fabry's disease. So in these individuals, we really refer to um, physicians in order to rule this out, um, giving them the reason for the diagnosis. So the second condition that I want to share with you is one that's uh, much more common than Fabry's disease and, um, and also vortex keratopathy that we typically see that is um, that is utilize or that that we see with chronic medication use because again although we can see it we very rarely see it and um and that's something called floppy eyelid syndrome um, but floppy eyelid syndrome although we discuss it and talk about it a lot i think is probably one of the most underdiagnosed conditions in our clinics and offices and the reason I say that is because, um, and, and again, this is kind of a gut check time to, to really reassess your examination on individuals. Now, if you're averting every eyelid, um, you're going to catch these patients and catch these individuals. But my recommendation is if you're not averting the eyelid on every patient,